Amen. What a wonderful song. What a wonderful psalm. And great to sing before this lesson, especially. I think Michael had a hunch about that. We've been talking about the Bible in a series of lessons this year. And particularly two weeks ago, we started this conversation about how is it that we interpret the Bible and do so correctly. Paul makes a statement that Angel read for us earlier in our service. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul says this, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. I think this statement well articulates the point that we were trying to emphasize two weeks ago. Paul says that the word of God, the Bible, the Bible must be handled rightly, which clearly implies that it can be handled wrongly. And that this process of handling the Word of God, that is understanding it, thinking about it, teaching it to other people, this requires care. Paul describes it like a worker or a craftsman that uses skill in handling the Word. It requires effort. Do your best, Paul says. Be diligent, some translations say. And notice that Paul says that our approval before God depends on the way that we handle the Word of God, rightly or wrongly. Let me say that again, and you see it in the verse. Our approval before God depends on the way that we handle the Word of truth, rightly or wrongly. And so, we would ask this obvious and vital question. How do we do this? How do we handle the Word of God correctly? How do we interpret it properly? That's the question that we hope to discuss over the next few minutes this morning. Our plan for the lesson is basically to do three things. I'm going to say, and you've probably heard these before, there are two basic questions to ask whenever you're reading any passage of the Bible to interpret it or to understand it. Two questions to ask. Then we're going to put those questions in, in the context of some larger principles of Bible interpretation that are important to keep in mind. And then we will quickly at the end look at two examples to practice this to some degree and see what it looks like as we read specific portions of Scripture. Now, before we start, there's a few things I feel the need to say that may not be necessary. One of those is that this is, for me, a little bit overwhelming, a little bit intimidating, because it's the kind of lesson that makes me feel like I have to make the whole Bible make sense to you in half an hour. And that's just not possible, and especially not in this very limited format that we have here, right? But I think sometimes we wish it was that easy, and maybe sometimes we think that there's like a formula for Bible interpretation, that there's a formula, there's a process, and any passage you're reading, you can just punch it through that formula, and it'll spit out the right answer, and it's as easy as that. I want to say that's not the way that Bible interpretation works. The Bible is too rich and too deep for that kind of simplistic approach, and as you know, the Bible is way too varied in terms of the kinds of writing, right? We're talking about everything from Genesis to Psalms to Isaiah to Matthew to Peter to the Revelation. And so there's no one simple formula that you just run things through and it spits out the answer. But we are going to be talking this morning about method, about questions to ask as we read the Bible. So there is a process of some sort, and we're going to be talking about that. And for that reason, this lesson is probably going to feel more like a Bible class or a lecture, and I apologize for that on some level, but I will say this, that if the Bible is the Word of God, and it is everything that we have just sung, it is the Word of God that converts our soul from death to life, that it is the Word of God that endures forever, that makes us clean, that shines the wisdom and the light of Christ into our minds to bring us out of our darkness. If the Word of God is all of these amazing things that we believe it to be, we need to read it well. And at some point, we need to stop and ask some of these questions like, how do you read and understand the Bible correctly? And so that's what I hope to accomplish, and I hope that it's helpful for you and your reading and for us in our joint effort of reading and understanding the Word of God together. Okay, two basic questions to ask and to answer when we are reading any portion of Scripture. In short, they are these. First question, what did it mean for them? That is, the original audience. Second question, what does it mean for us? 
And it is important that we ask these questions in that order. So first, what did the text that we are reading, whatever passage you're reading, what did it mean for the people who first heard or received these words? And so we need to know who exactly that is, because these texts, we've said this before, you may have heard this, these texts that we are reading anywhere in the Bible, they were written for us, absolutely, but they were not written to us. This is maybe most clear and most obvious in the letters of the New Testament, okay? Not a single one of the letters of the New Testament was addressed to the Bel Air Church of Christ in Houston, Texas, 2024. Not one of them. It's been said that when you read the letters of the New Testament, you are reading someone else's mail, right? And that's true, and it is true of the rest of the books of the Bible as well. They were not written to us originally. And so we need to understand what it meant when it was written for the people for whom it was written. So who are those people? Sometimes we don't exactly know who wrote a book or exactly who it was written to. Sometimes that answer is very general, like the book of Genesis is clearly written for the Israelites, for God's people in the time of Moses. Sometimes that, that answer is more specific. The prophet Micah, the individual, is writing for the people who lived in the southern kingdom of Judah in the time of King Ahaz and King Hezekiah, right? Or the apostle Paul is writing a letter to Titus, the individual, or to the Corinthian church specifically. But we need to know... Who is writing and who is receiving what is being written and what's going on with them, right? What's their situation? What do we know about them? Some of that is basic but very important. Are they living before the time of Christ? Are they followers of Jesus? What's going on in the history that we know of? What big events have happened recently or are about to happen? Where are they in their setting? What kind of circumstances are they experiencing? Are they in captivity? Are they returned from captivity? Are the Christians receiving this letter going through persecution? Are they in danger of falling away? What's going on with the people that would have been reading the book that we are looking at? But the question of genre or type of writing is also crucially important because, again, we've talked about this. The kind of book that you are reading determines the way that you read it. Just like you go to the library, there are genres on different shelves. And if you grab a mystery or you grab a romance or you grab nonfiction or a biography or a cookbook or a self-help book, those books are written differently and you read them differently. So these people receive this text that I am, I'm looking at. What kind of writing is it? Is it a story? Is it a narrative? Is it the history of their people? Is it law, specific instructions? You guys need to do this, this, and this, and this. Is it written in poetry? Okay. Part of the importance of this question is to know whether the message of the text is being communicated directly or indirectly. Okay. Some of the texts of the Bible are communicating a message very directly. Isaiah, this is the word of God. You need to do this and this. Paul, I am writing from God, from Jesus. You need to be doing this and this. Okay. But some writing in the Bible, like poems or stories, communicate a message more indirectly, that you experience or, or think through what is being told in the story, and there's something to take from that. Okay? And there are specific conventions of each genre right, that we need to be uh, paying attention to. Are we supposed to be taking everything at face value, or are we looking at figurative language here? All of those things are influenced by the kind of writing that it is, and we need to pay attention to that uh, piece of the puzzle, so to speak. And then, whatever kind of writing that we are looking at, whatever the genre is, it's important to always keep the big picture in mind. This is the word context that we emphasized recently as well. If you're watching a show and you're watching season three, episode two, uh, you just jumped into that one, Alex is already smiling. He knows what I'm going to say. You would like to know what happened in Season 3, Episode 1. You'd also like to know what happened in Season 1 and 2. Or you may completely misunderstand what it is that you are watching. Same thing is true in the Bible. You're reading a narrative like Genesis or Acts. You kind of want to know what happened in the narrative leading up to this point. Also, you want to know what is going to happen after this because the whole story is there for you. The same thing is true in the messages of the prophets or the, the, the instructions of the apostles. What were the instructions leading up to this point? And then how does the author tie all this together 
going forward. So context, seeing the big picture. And then with all of this, I think we are prepared to start making some conclusions about what is the message being conveyed. Again, we're talking about to the people reading this. In their time and place, in the context, in this genre of writing, what is being communicated to them? Is there a lesson here about God? Is there a principle that's being conveyed about what it means to follow God? Is the author of this text giving his reader specific commands to follow as written? Or is the storyteller of this book offering examples for his readers to maybe imitate or not imitate? Is there general wisdom being expounded upon here? What's the message being conveyed to the people that were reading this text originally? These texts were written to other people. We need to understand what it meant for them first. And then from there, I would say that we are prepared to make the step to the second question. So, two questions in Bible interpretation. First question, what did it mean for them? Second question then, what does it mean for us? I think to answer that question, it is important to start really not with ourselves, but with Jesus. Because we are coming to the text, the reason that we are reading the Bible and that we are seeking to understand it is because we are followers of Jesus. Because Jesus is the king, because we have submitted our lives to him. And he has told us that all of these scriptures are for us. And he has told us that all these scriptures are about him. Jesus said all the Old Testament is about him. Obviously all the New Testament is about him. And so after we understand what the text meant when it was written, we need to bring it forward to Christ. Obviously that's easier to do in the New Testament. You're reading the Gospels. These are stories of Jesus, our king. That we are reading. These are teachings that Jesus spoke with his own mouth for his disciples to, to hear and to obey. The letters of the apostles, these are the direct representatives of Jesus that he appointed to speak and to write on his behalf to people who are following him. The New Testament is easier along these lines, but the Old Testament sometimes takes a little more thinking. How does the Old Testament story I'm reading get us to Jesus? The story of Israel, all those long chapters and books of the Old Testament, the story, the history is eventually leading to the coming of the Messiah. So how does the history get us to that point? Tosin did an excellent job around the Lord's table, as many of these speakers often do before the Lord's Supper, talking about the types and the shadows of the Old Testament. You're reading about Old Testament ritual, Old Testament law, Old Testament symbols, and these things are pointing forward to what Christ will be in the substance. The characters of the Old Testament, people like Moses, people like David and Joseph, oftentimes they are shadows of Jesus, and some element of their life is prefiguring what Jesus will accomplish or Jesus' nature. And as you know, there are direct prophecies or foretellings of the Old Testament prophets about the coming Messiah and about His kingdom. So use Jesus as the lens through which to read and to understand all of Scripture. And then from there, we can bring it to ourselves. But in order to do that, we need to understand the relationship between that audience that we've already thought about, okay? The people it was written to, what's their relationship to us? And we need to understand and identify the relevant differences and similarities between them and us. You're reading something in the Old Testament. This was written to people who were under a different covenant. They were living under the Old Covenant, the Law of Moses. That is a critical difference in terms of how they related to God, how we relate to God. We need to understand that. Okay? Even in the New Covenant, the Christians of the first century were living in a different setting, a different time and place, and some of those differences are relevant. For instance, Paul writes to the Corinthian church, they're living in a time in which the apostles are still alive and the apostles have given gifts of the Holy Spirit that are miraculous in nature. Okay, Well, that's different than the situation we are in now that that time has passed and we have the complete revealed Word of God. And so there are critical differences to pay attention to from the original audience to us. But of course, there are relevant similarities. If they are following Jesus under the new covenant and so are we, then there's a parallel there. And you know, as well as I do from your reading the Old Testament, that even under the Old Covenant, even in the Law of Moses, there are oftentimes very direct similarities between what those people were going through. The choices that someone like Daniel or David or Moses had to make to the choices that we make. 
the temptations that were presented to Adam and Eve that are really the same temptations that we are faced with. But we have to make that step, whether it's direct similarity to the audience of the text, or whether it is indirect and working through the differences from them to us, we need to understand there are relationship to the original audience so that we can finally answer what is it about this text that carries over and is applicable or important for us. All right? It's one of the reasons why, as I've said before, questions like what does this text say about God uh, is hugely important because that never changes. Right? God is the same God. When we see his nature and his character in the Old Testament, that is still true today. Similarly, there are often principles. We're seeing this in our study of Leviticus that may seem like the most irrelevant book you could possibly imagine in the Bible for us today. We're seeing principles about God's instruction, about God's holiness. Those principles carry over even if the specific commands don't carry over. Same thing with examples. We may read examples of the Old Testament that we learn from in some way. But examples of Christians in the New Testament that are following Jesus, you see those examples are more closely parallel to our situation. And so we would pay closer attention, for instance, to the way that the Christians worshiped God together, the way that they gathered and shared their lives together in all aspects. Because that's an example for us in a similar situation as followers of Jesus. And same thing with commands. We may read commands of the Law of Moses that carry over differently than reading commands of the apostles speaking to Christians, to followers of Jesus like us. Over and over again in the Bible, in the New Testament in particular, the Bible says that the Scriptures, all Scripture, is written to benefit us directly. It is, it is valuable, it is, it is for us. Paul says in Romans 15 and in 1 Corinthians 10 that the stories of the Old Testament were written down for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Peter says in 1 Peter 1 that the prophets didn't even know what they were writing about half the time because they were serving us who now see these things fulfilled in Jesus. And Paul, of course, says in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture, and he's talking really primarily about the Old Testament, and it applies to the New Testament. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for us in all of these ways to make us complete as men and women of God. So all Scripture is for us and directly benefits us, but we need to understand first what it meant when it was written, then see it through the lens of Jesus, who fulfills all of these things, and then relate the message to us, in our time and our place as followers of Jesus. So those are your two questions, any passage you're reading. What did it mean for them? What does it mean for us? But as we do that, I think there's some important principles to keep in mind. There are more than these, I'm sure, but these are three things that come to mind to make us aware of that in some ways are like guardrails to keep us headed in the right direction and to keep us from avoiding common pitfalls. One of these important principles is that Scripture will never contradict Scripture. We just saw that all Scripture is inspired by God. So it's all true, and so it will all fit together. Scripture will not contradict any other Scripture. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't developments in the story of the Bible. Okay? Paul's saying in 1 Timothy 4 that all foods are able to be eaten with thanksgiving is not a contradiction of Leviticus 11 that says that you can't eat shellfish. Right? You see, there's a development in the law and in the covenant. This also doesn't mean that there aren't different voices or perspectives in Scripture. The, the, the voice of the, the proverb writer is different than the voice of the preacher in Ecclesiastes, for instance. The perspective of Mark telling the story of the life of Jesus is different than the perspective of John telling the story of the life of Jesus. But it is consistent. It does not contradict, and it upholds itself. Which is why you might hear someone say that the Bible is its own best commentary. What that means is that oftentimes if I'm reading one passage of Scripture and I'm having a hard time making sense of it, there are other passages of Scripture about a similar topic or about a similar person that I can go and read and it will help make sense of the other passage that I was reading. Now, 
I will say, we've already talked about the importance of context. My suggestion is always stick it out as long as you can in the book you are reading. Let the context help you understand any passage instead of just jumping around this verse to that verse to this verse to that verse, right? That's not really the way the Bible was given to us. That being said, especially if we're reading a difficult passage that we don't understand, oftentimes there's an easier passage somewhere else that helps to shed light on or make sense of the difficult passage that we are looking at. And so it helps us, the Bible, as it's all interconnected, helps us understand what all of these passages mean. The other reason this is important, again, as a guardrail, is to say that if you're studying the Scripture and you come up with a conclusion from a certain passage, and you don't know of any other Scripture in the Bible that would support that passage, it's probably a, or support that conclusion, that's probably a reason to go back and rethink the conclusion that you've drawn, check your work, so to speak, and re-examine the text in light of everything we know in Scripture. That's one important principle or guardrail, that, that one Scripture will not contradict another. Another important principle is that God has given us teachers, and that is a part of His plan. In the passage that Angel read for us from 2 Timothy 2, earlier in verse 2, he had said, What you have heard, Timothy, Paul says, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You see, there's four generations mentioned in this one verse. Paul has taken these things as an apostle of Christ. Maybe that's a fifth. We're starting from the beginning. But Paul has taken these things as an apostle of Christ. He's passed them on to Timothy. He's telling Timothy to teach them to faithful men who can then teach others also, right? And that chain is still carrying on, even till today, that teachers have taught teachers who have taught teachers who have taught teachers, and people have taught people. Disciples have made disciples all the way down to our own day. And what I want to say is this is a part of God's plan, and we should appreciate that, and we should lean on it. As much as all of us should be personally studying and reading and meditating on God's Word, I'm going to say we were not intended to read and understand the Bible in total isolation. We were given a community of disciples. We were given people to learn with. So what I would say is, one, take advantage of that reality and that beautiful plan of God. Take advantage of faithful teachers who can help you to understand, whether that's in this congregation, people you know, or great resources these days of sermons and Bible classes online, not to mention books that are written by faithful men and women. Take advantage of that. Take advantage of the learning that we're doing as a church in these Bible classes as we help each other. Ask questions of wise men and women that you know to help you understand something that doesn't make sense to you. So take advantage of uh, of God's plan. Appreciate God's plan to learn from faithful teachers and learn alongside other people. But I would also say, similar to the point before, be careful if you come to a conclusion in a passage that you've never heard anybody say before or heard anybody teach before. No offense to you, but if no one has ever thought of what you came up with in 2,000 years of of people studying the Bible, you may want to rethink what you've come up with, right? And go back and look at the text. And especially if you don't know anybody faithful and trustworthy that would hold that position, that would teach that thing, that would agree with you and support it, then again, that's maybe a red flag to go back and look at the text again. There's a reason why we have the church to help us as we learn. There's a reason why we have these faithful teachers. And then the final thing I would say in terms of important principles is that God wants us to use our brains. He wants us to use common sense and to use our hearts and be open in our hearts, in humility and honesty. We said in the lesson two weeks ago that uh, God in His grace has given us writings that we can understand, right? But think about that. It's not just that He's given us the writings. He's given us the minds that can read, that can understand, okay? And again, He wants us to understand. He's given us these things in a way that we can understand, And you don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to have a PhD in order to understand the Bible, although learning, of course, can help us. You don't have to be a scholar, but you do have to think. You do have to use your brain. You have to use your mind. You have to apply that mind. You have to, as Jesus said, love God with all of your mind. 
and think through the text as it has been given us. And so common sense is required. And it could be, and I actually hope this is the case, that a lot of what we've already said today to you, you're like, this is easy. This is common sense. This is just the way you read anything. And I hope that's true, and that is largely true. We're, we're using common sense to read and understand the Bible the way that we would read and understand anything else. And I think in that, we can have some assurance. In fact, Paul said in that verse we started with to Timothy, that do your best to present yourself to God, one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. We can be confident that if we're applying our minds to read and understand Scripture, we can understand what God has given us, and we can be assured of that. But of course, it also takes humility and honesty. One of the chief reasons why we or others come up with wrong interpretations of the Bible is because we are reading a passage and trying to impose our ideas and our preconceived notions on the text. We go to the text to justify what I think or how I'm living. We go to the text to justify what our church teaches or what our tradition is. We go to the text to prove that we're right, essentially. If we're doing that, we're going to be in trouble. But if we go to the text with an open mind and an open heart, willing to learn, willing to listen then we can be assured that we can understand and know what it is that God has revealed to us. So, I would say again, this is not a formula. But what I am encouraging us is to come to the text with an open mind and an open heart, to apply our faculties, to use our brain to think, to start with the text and what it meant for the people who first read it, to see that, understanding in that message through the lens of Jesus and then connect that to us and to engage in this learning process alongside one another helping each other and asking questions of each other keeping everything within the bounds of what God has revealed to us in his complete word and to do that over and over again to practice and to proceed with confidence and humility as we continue to learn and grow okay Real quickly, let's just look at two examples, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament, and uh, just see what this might look like um, in kind of a condensed version of the, uh, the method, so to speak, that we have laid out. The first of these examples is Jeremiah 29, 11. The verse reads, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. I hear this verse cited quite often. And usually it's cited to say that, you know, God has a plan for my life and everything's going to work out. Everything's going to work out great. I may not see it right now. I may not understand it right now, but everything's going to work out because, as the Bible said, I know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare and not for evil. Okay, so let's apply our questions here. First, what did this verse mean for the people it was written to? And again, we got to ask, well, who is the audience? Who is this being said to? Who's the you in the verse here? Well, as is often the, the solution, in large part, we could just go back and read the entire chapter of Jeremiah 29. And we see that Jeremiah the prophet is writing a letter to these Hebrew exiles who have been taken away from their homeland into captivity. And right away, as, as, as boring as it is, that all of that means we've got to understand some Old Testament history and what's going on here. Okay? The Jews, the people of God, have been unfaithful to the covenant. God has punished them by taking them away to uh, captivity in Babylon. Jeremiah is addressing those very exiles, the text says. And in this letter that you could read in Jeremiah 29, especially if you know more about the larger book of Jeremiah, you would see that Jeremiah is actually having to counter people who are going around saying, hey, no, 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 this exile thing is no big deal. Everything's going to work out fine. Maybe a couple years we'll be over there, but we're going to be back soon. Everything's going to be just peachy, right? And Jeremiah is saying, no, that's a lie. That's not true. That's not God's plan. In fact, the verse right before, verse 11, he says that God's plan is for there to be 70 years of exile. That's a lifetime. But then that after the 70-year exile because of their sins, God is promising that he will fulfill what he always said to his people, that he will bring them back and plant them once again in the land. If they will seek the Lord with all of their heart, he will restore them to the, the promised land. Okay, that's what the text meant 
uh, at least again in summary, in Jeremiah 29. So what does that mean for us? Well, hopefully right away we see, well, two things. One is it's not just a general statement that, hey, things always work out, right? And it's also not a direct statement to Daniel Broadwell that says, Daniel, I know the plans I have for you, and they're, they're good plans, okay? But remember that idea of the differences and the similarities between the audience and us. We are not those Hebrew exiles living in Babylon, okay? It's a critical difference. But if you see this through the lens of Christ, you understand that in Christ we are the chosen people of God. We are now true Israel. And that the New Testament speaks about the fact that we as the people of Jesus are living in a type of exile, are we not? Peter says that we are sojourners and exiles, and later in the book he, he suggests that we are living in Babylon, metaphorically, right? We are living in a world in which we don't belong. And so in that way there is a similarity. But think about what the similarity means. Like them, we're going to be here, right, until the end of the exile, right? Uh, many of those people individually in Babylon, they died before they ever came back or they never returned when it was time to go back. Similarly for us, our exile in Babylon will not end until the Lord returns. That is when God is going to fulfill this great promise. And yes, He has that plan. Yes, He has that promise. And we can take confidence in that. That the Lord will return. And when He returns, He will rescue us from our exile. And we will be home with Him in a new heavens and a new earth. And we can be assured of that. But that's different than saying that within my lifetime, everything's going to work out because God's got a plan for my life. Okay, second example comes from the book of Acts chapter 16 in the New Testament. And the verses read, Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. You hear this verse come up in questions, maybe a discussion about what exactly does a person have to do to be saved? Or you may hear this, this verse um, at the end of a, of a call to salvation to say, hey, you've heard the gospel message. Here's what the Bible says, right? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. But what did it mean uh, for the original readers? Again, is the question that we want to start with. Well, what are we reading here in Acts chapter 16? Well, we are reading a story. It's a very long story. The book of Acts is a big narrative. And the story of the book of Acts is the story of the gospel going out into all creation. And the message of Jesus being proclaimed. And you have all these episodes, one after the other, of the apostle or someone else proclaiming the message of Jesus. And then the response, either positively or negatively, to that message. And so this one instance here of, uh, of someone responding or being offered uh, a response is not an isolated incident. None of these are isolated. They are all within the context of the story of the book of Acts and the spread of the gospel. In particular, we are in Acts 16. Paul and Silas are in the city of Philippi. They first met a woman named Lydia, who's a Jew, understood the scriptures. It says she paid attention to what Paul said. The Lord opened her heart and she was baptized. Later on in chapter 16, Paul and Silas get thrown in prison. That night there's an earthquake and the jail breaks open. And it is the jailer who is asking this question to Paul and Silas. And I think it's a pretty safe assumption that the jailer knew very, very, very little, if maybe nothing, about Jesus. Maybe he had wind of what Paul and Silas were saying. Maybe he had heard their, their songs and their prayers they offered in the jail cell. But he's basically coming to this with no prior knowledge. He's scared. He's in distress. And he says, what must I do to be saved? And maybe he doesn't even know exactly what that means. And so Paul's answer, by the way, is a true answer. And it is an answer to generally direct the jailer to the source of salvation. You're scared. You're in distress. Jesus can save you, right? Trust in him. And that is exactly what Jesus himself said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But of course, the story continues. And they go back that very night, it says. They go into the house. Paul teaches the jailer, again, who basically knew nothing. Paul teaches him. Uh, that same hour, it says, that the jailer washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, the text says in verse 33. And by the way, in the next verse... 
Luke, the author, summarizes what just happened, and he says that the jailer rejoiced that he had believed God. And so, to me, that helps us to define our terms here. Luke's summary of, of the jailer's response is he believed God, because that's what he did. He put his trust in Jesus, and when you trust Jesus, you do everything that Jesus tells you to do. And that helps us to also understand Paul's statement. Paul is not saying in here in verse 31 this is one isolated mental action that you complete, and once you check that off, then you're saved. He's saying, no, the general answer of salvation is trust in King Jesus. And that's exactly what the jailer does, and as he learns what he's supposed to do, he is baptized and rejoices that he's put his trust in Jesus. So what does it mean for us? Well, I would say that as we read the, the book of Acts, again, it's a story. And any one of these stories in the book of Acts is not intended to be a checklist of the things that we have to do in order to jump through the hoops and be saved. And one of the reasons we know that is because the different stories in the book of Acts don't always mention all the things that are mentioned in every other story. Sometimes the stories of Acts just say the people believed, and that's it. Sometimes the stories in Acts say they followed the teaching of the apostles. Sometimes it says they repented and they were baptized. Sometimes it just says they were baptized. And you would never pick up any of those isolated stories and say, oh, that's all that's required right there. Instead, what we see is, is this larger picture of the gospel going out into the world as it continues to go out into the world, as the gospel has come to us, and as the Bible goes to other people through us. And as the gospel goes out, there is a response. And you can read the entire book of Acts and see on the whole what it means to respond to King Jesus and the good news that he is king and rules over all. And in most general terms, the way that you respond to the gospel message is that you trust King Jesus. And when you trust the king, you do what he says. You follow the commands that are given. And that's why when you read the book of Acts, you see over and over again, people had to repent they had to confess their, their evil ways. They had to get rid of the sin in their lives. They had to be baptized to enter into that covenant with Jesus. And all of these things, and then from there, follow the teaching of the apostles. All of these things fall into this general answer that Paul gave to the Philippian jailer to believe, to trust in the Lord Jesus, which is exactly what we are called to do as well. Okay, that's probably a fitting place to end. And I appreciate your uh, good patience and your good attention this morning. As I said before, I hope this is helpful uh, as we try to get the Word of God into our hearts and minds. Because as you know, this Word transforms us, it changes us, and it guides us. Um, the Word that Jesus has given us is the Word of eternal life. We're thankful for it, and we lean on it. We build our lives and what we are doing as a church on this beautiful and awesome Word of God. But we need to read it well, and hopefully the lesson this morning has helped us to do just that. But we're going to sing a song, and in this song is our, is our custom. We will offer an invitation. The song is, I Surrender All, and that's exactly what we've just finished talking about. When you come to Jesus, you trust in Him and you surrender everything, to do what He said, to live for Him. And if you have not made that decision yet, you have not been baptized into the blood of Jesus to wash away your sins. Do that this morning. Any way we can help you, please now come to the front as we stand and sing. <laughs>